so my name is Ebe. I'm the CEO of uh, Linden Lab. Linden, Linden Lab is the, uh, we're the creators of the massive virtual world called Second Life. Uh, so we've learned a lot over the years of what um, happens in, in virtual space. So I'm here to talk about why it's important to democratize uh, the ability to create and distribute uh, virtual reality experiences. So why does VR matter? Well, v VR will impact almost everything. Uh, we're on the verge of a time when we can uh, communicate and interact with each other in virtual space as if it's in a real space, not very sim dissimilar to, to this space right here. It's different from just apps and content that we consume because in virtual reality we can create a space that we can inhabit, that we can be inside of, where we interact with each other naturally just like we would do in physical space. So we'll be able to step into any 3D environment and have conversations, share, and socialize with each other. And that's you know, the basis for almost everything humans do. So I'm going to talk about a few examples that we've seen over the years and uh, that we know are coming up uh, related to this. This is Fran. She's 88 years old. She has Parkinson's. So physical movement is quite a challenge for her. But in virtual life, she's extremely active. She goes dancing. She goes swimming. She socializes with friends and family and is, just has a full active life. She's also found that this activity in the virtual space actually is improving her ability to move about in physical space. So there's something that's happening to her brain when she's performing all these activities in virtual space that is improving her uh, f mental, uh, physical health. There's, there's a lot of interesting things to study in that area. Um, one researcher, um, Jeremy Balenson from uh, Stanford University, he's been studying VR for over 20 years. Um, he's found that basically the brain cannot distinguish between what's virtual and what's real. They're both real. One's physical, one's virtual, but to us, as we experience them, they're equally real. Uh, for example, he took a a class of uh, second graders to his virtual reality lab where they experienced going underneath into the ocean uh, amongst the fishes. I've done that myself at his lab. And um, a month later, he spoke to those kids, and half the kids had false memories of having to be the SeaWorld Aquarium. They had no idea that that was a memory that was from a virtual experience. To them, it was real. So because our brains treat VR experience as real, it's an extremely powerful medium. And it's already being used in Second Life and other places as well to treat uh, PTSD, uh, phobias, and used for all kinds of therapies, weight loss, support groups. So in the future, it's going to be widely used to improve both physical and mental well-being. Because experiencing something is often way more powerful than just reading about something or, or watching a video about something, actually being there and doing it, it makes it a very powerful medium for how we teach and how we learn. Uh, Texas A&M has been using Second Life to teach chemistry uh, at the university level. And uh, they've actually done a, a, an A-B test, if you will, between the virtual students 
and a control group of the traditional physical students in the physical uh, chemistry lab. And they've found that the virtual students slightly outperform the physical students. And that's not even VR yet. That's just using a PC screen to sort of do the virtual activities. Imagine when you can actually be in there and actually like virtually sit on molecules and interacting with, with the, 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 the world of chemistry. VR also makes it possible to do things that are otherwise impossible. You're going to be able to take students on a class trip to the Colosseum back in ancient Rome. Take them to the moon at the moon landing. Or take them inside the human body for an anatomy class. Again, uh, VR experiences impact the brain in such a way that we feel they're real. So it's going to be an extremely powerful medium for teaching and learning. Commerce. Uh, virtual commerce is, is, is quite large in Second Life itself. Just inside Second Life, last year, creators of virtual goods and services cashed out over $60 million. So a lot of people make a living inside the virtual world. One designer um, creating clothing, so, you know, not, not these ones exactly, but similar. Um, she sells these couture dresses for people to go to parties. And she sold, she sells them for about four US dollars a piece. And she has sold over 300,000 of them today. She just started as a hobby, and then she became a brand, and it became a business, and now it's the way she makes her living. It's not only for individuals, but it's also ultimately going to be for uh, businesses and brands, and how you connect with your customers, and how you sell what you have to offer. So in the future, this is how you will test drive a car. This is how you will um, try out some new furniture in your, for your apartment in, in physical space. Or you'll also buy the matching virtual item for your virtual home. You'll try out clothing this way, glasses, whatever it might be. You'll be able to feel what it's like to have those items before you purchase. You'll also do customer service and support this way. You'll meet a support person in virtual space. And they'll help you walk through how to use this new fancy gadget that you just got from Amazon. <laughs> it will also change how we do business and how we work. When you can create a space, be there and interact with other people, just like we are right here, that's going to be extremely powerful for a lot of different use cases and scenarios. Uh, earlier this year, I spoke inside of Second Life at an education conference in front of about 200 avatars. Yeah, I guess not that dissimilar for what's happening right here right now, but I was doing it in front of my desk, and I didn't have to travel across the world. It'll also be very essential for people where visualization and understanding of space or, or objects is critical. Uh, we're right now working with uh, a huge architecture firm that's building this massive medical complex. And Diego, one of the architects there, uh, has worked with us to put their um, entire building inside our new platform that I'll discuss in a bit. Um, and experienced it in virtual reality. They've been working on this project for a long time. And the first time he walked into the lobby and he looked up and he goes, damn, it's too big. It took him one second to realize that something was off. And they've been working on this project for a long time. So that had value instantly to them. So the fact that you can create any kind of space, be in that space, and interact with each other and with virtual items around you uh, is going to make an incredibly powerful medium for, for doing work and business. 
So it's a great medium for communication. It lets you create reality and experience something that you otherwise couldn't. And it will really change journalism, politics, and our capacity to empathize with, with others. Uh, a, a journalist um, who actually worked on where this image is from, uh, her name is uh, Noni de la Pena from the Emblematic Group. Uh, she does journalism where you as a uh, consumer of, of her stories or information are placed on the scene of the story. So instead of just reading about it or watching it, you're in the, on the scene, at the place of the action, amongst the people. This is from a Syrian refugee camp, so you get a good feel for what it's like to be at that place as someone who is there. Not just watching them, being there. She's also done a great um, bit about people standing in the food line because they're poor and someone next to you falls over and passes out and you can really feel and empathize with, with these people of what it's like to be there. Very different from just reading or watching. So it's gonna make a huge impact on how we can empathize and understand other people. And this is why Chris Milk, I highly recommend you look at his TED talk on virtual reality. Um, he has called virtual reality the ultimate empathy machine. I love that. Of course, VR can just be fun. Um, it's an incredible medium for entertainment. Most of what we hear about today is, is our games coming out that are VR related, and that's because most of the skills creating 3D experiences, interactive experiences, come from the gaming industry. And it's also a big business. Um, but ultimately, it will not just be games. It'll be how we socialize and hang out. Um, in Second Life, there's a lot of live music. You go to, so you, you go to pubs and hang out with friends and watch some live music. Or you go watch a football game together. Even though you're all over the world in different places, in your homes or wherever you might be. So also a lot of hobbies. In Second Life, there's sailing communities, beach communities, any sort of subject or interest you can imagine. There are groups that are sort of forming around creating these communities and, and having fun together. A common thread amongst the experience experiences is that they are real. You will, over time, have a hard time distinguishing of what you did in, in physical meat space and what you did in virtual space. They will just start to blend. So, where are we today? Well, it's pretty early, but there's a huge amount of progress that's happened just in the last year alone. I think in the last year we've had more progress than the previous decade. Uh, and there's a lot of technologies coming together, whether it's display technologies, tracking technologies. Uh, so it's, it's starting to really happen. So we're right at the, at the beginning of it really becoming meaningful to consumer at scale. But it's still really hard. It's difficult to create VR experiences. Um, pretty much the only ones that can do, to do it today are sophisticated engineering organizations that have a lot of technical skill to produce these types of experiences, and that, that just won't do over time. I mean, take, take this conference. If, if the people who made this conference had to actually construct the buildings and all the furniture and all the AV system and everything to put this together, it would just, it would just like be way too much. Uh, it shouldn't be that hard. So it needs to be an easier way to create experiences in VR. And, and it's also limiting the diversity of the type of content and type of experiences we can have. And it's, it's not yet like a really personal experience because it's not your identity and your space that, that you're taking part in. 
So, and it's because it's real, it's not just like it's about apps and content that you consume, it's, it's life itself. It's friendships, it's family, it's real relationships, and things that are, are just real. And so identity becomes really important. And uh, yeah, so how do, we, how do we get there? This is just an example of what happened when we made it easy for people to take and share photographs. You know, this is in the billions. And you can clearly see in a very short amount of time, it just, it just popped. Because back in the day, you had to have someone come paint you, and then you know, a couple of guys could take that flash photo, and that was it. Now we all take photos all day long. So the, for the, the use cases for taking photos has increased, and um, it's just an explosion in the amount of content. This is, you can see a similar graph, whether it's photos, videos, text. And VR will have a similar curve. It's a little further out, but, but it will happen. So it's just a matter of getting the t technology to the right place and, and make it easy enough for people to create and share. I'm confident that it's relatively soon. I mean, it's, it's years, not decades. We're seeing a lot of the pieces come together. Um, huge amount of investment from the biggest player you can imagine, whether it's Facebook with Oculus, uh, Microsoft, Sony, I mean, Google, like they're all involved in pushing in this direction of, of taking sort of the, what we can experience on the web to not just be kind of the flat thing we have today, but actually real virtual space we can all interact in. I mean, Oculus probably could not have been created even four years ago. And it's that point in time when just all these technologies sort of match up at the same time, at the same place, that it can take off. So it's an ex incredibly exciting time, and we're well on our way in a future where, where millions will be able to take advantage of virtual reality. At Linden Lab, we've been working for about two years now on a next generation platform we call Project Sansar real name TBD. Um, we still have a bit over a year to go for, before general availability. But we're taking the experiences we've learned from operating Second Life for over 12 years to make it possible for all of us to be able to create and share and participate in virtual reality. I'd like to thank you for your time, and uh, I'm just gonna, sh you know, look look out for more information on Sansar over the coming quarters. We'll start the beta in the middle of next year, and general availability by the end of next year. Um, and here, just a little sneak peek at what some of the creators on staff have done, just to sort of start to test the platform. It's a little taste. Thank you.